Yeah, that's our, our first meeting with Jennifer Lemon. I thought she did a very good job for the first time on radio. Yeah, and she brought food, which I can't emphasize enough how much that helps the interview process go along. Yeah, if they cannot appear in studio, they could probably send it to us by Uber. There's such as the next guest who's on frequently. When's the last time he sent food here, That's Rob? That's a good point, yeah. Bill. If it were Phil, it would be something healthy, right? It would be, you we know, don't want healthy food. Quinoa and uh, shoots. It Morning, Philly. It probably would be. It probably would be because I, I care so deeply about you guys. And that's why I actually don't come in because I don't want to have to bring brownies. I feel the pressure that if I'm to come in, I need brownies or donuts or something like that. No. And I care deeply about your cardiovascular health. Phil, so you, you I, can bring in to to bring in roasted broccoli. We would love to have well, that. A little bit of you know, some chicken, some roasted broccoli. That would be perfect. Know, some hot cheese still, to dip it in. Still, <laughs> <laughs> There's still a lot of pressure with that, though, because of the presentation of it. You know, going back to when uh, poor poor Bill brought some stuff in, and you didn't like the presentation of it and gave him fits about it. Yeah, he did. I'd forgotten so about that. Phil. And it, it is. Let's, it's and, a, it's let's get this straight. And, and you know, it, it was, and it did not hurt me, Phil. It was my wife that he was throwing stones at, and who wants to throw stones at, at lovely it, Bonnie? It's a high bar to, to come in there and, and satisfy Rob's culinary needs. Let, let's is. get this and, straight right away. The, the <laughs> issue, as I recall it, <laughs> When Bill brought the food in, is that Bill ate half of it on the way in, no, and then no. he he handed me a uh, an open container of half-eaten stuff and said, "Here you go, Mario. You get the leftovers." No, it's just that my mine was mislabeled. <laughs> no, there were two incidences. One one was when you called a a carrot cake a coconut cake. And the other was when you ate half the stuff on the way in and then gave me the rest and tried to pass it off as you, you, I remember you that yourself. now. Yes. Yeah, yeah. That was a, a slight, slight uh, misunderstanding. Not, not that I didn't appreciate getting to eat the Stubblefield leftovers, because after all, I mean, we're talking about some high society stuff over there at the estate. Come on, Phil. Jump in anytime you want to. He's got a staff. I mean, well, when you go over there, it's like being on that love boat show. That's why. You know, Rob asked, I was like, how long has it been since you've been in here? And I said, well, it's, it's been a long time. But the, the reason for it is because I, I don't trust that I can I can reach the bar that Rob has set for snacks. And so I'm, I'm afraid. I'm intimidated. It's been a good 10, 12 years since Phil. It was, he's never been in the new it, studio. It, it's, it, it, yeah, it has. Is, that yeah, is has. not true. You did a, you, you did a, you did a <laughs> Hatfield McCoy's report with your daughter. The one time that because you're like related to them. I've been in there at least five, at least five times since then. Well, what John was and I came he and John were here in my tent. One was to collect a bet because Gilstrap lost and he wouldn't pay, so you had to come and get the money from him <laughs> under threats. I remember that one. And then uh, the other one was the half field McCoy's report. Yeah. No, nah, that was a lot. I've been in at least five times since I half field McCoy since I brought Abigail in. At least five. Five times. times? At least. I don't remember yes, five minutes. at least. Did you bring at food least. in each time, Phil? I I didn't, and but that and that's. I mean, that's now. I felt I felt the cold shoulder while I was in there. I didn't feel welcome. Well, you know, if I it takes some of the pressure off, home. if it takes some of the pressure off, there are caterers that you can reach out to, and and have that's them send the food. Though. That's expensive. I have a, a young family that I'm trying to feed, and <laughs> I try to watch my pennies. That's expensive. Listen to this guy. <laughs> you need a new investment counselor. I mean, your, your wife's a financial advisor. Your wife's a principal, and you are a, a one of the top financial planners of the Eastern Panhandle region, Phil. You're swimming yes, in it. I'm planning. I'm planning on sending my children to school and retiring at a different time. So therefore. I can't get a caterer to uh, to send it to send food in there. Hey, did you have to catch uh, sixty minutes last night, Phil? I didn't, but I see the the outfall from it. I was actually traveling. I was as my typical weekend in the winter would be. I was driving back from a uh, from a volleyball tournament. Right, way too tired. I assume that you were, but I do do hear some of the outfall. Well, there's uh, which really I don't I don't know. I read the commentary. I don't know that he said anything any different than what he said on Wednesday, uh, just kind of confirming that. But what I've seen, you know, transition into our current markets, 
What I'd seen that I think is interesting is on Friday. I thought it was very interesting. Well, before Friday. you go on, Phil, hold on a second, because we, if we haven't set this up properly. Because uh, if you don't know what we're talking about, the Fed chairman, Jerome Powell, was on 60 Minutes last night doing an interview about the economy, inflation, rate cuts, and, and such. So uh, on that note, go ahead, Phil. So, and, and basically what he had said was that they're going to be careful in uh, making the decision to cut rates. And if you really look at the position that they're in, why would they? You know, what is the reason right now? If, you, if you're Jerome Powell, I get it if you're on the street why you want rates to be, to, to be cut. But if you're Jerome Powell, why would you cut rates? Our economy seemingly is humming along just fine. And inflation is still continue, is going down to that target. It's not there yet, but it's going. It's on its way to that target. So again, data driven with some of these reports that come out on a monthly basis. But it did take me back to Friday. That I thought Friday was a very interesting day. It was just one day, but Friday was a very interesting day because the jobs report came in exceedingly higher than what was expected, and that is typically good economic it is it's good economic news people are working our unemployment rate remains low and immediately and i think i texted you because i'd seen it between appointments and i'd seen our markets had taken a dive and i've screenshot and i was like oh look good news is bad news again and then by the end of the day we turned course but what didn't turn course was the bond market now to to before we get into a bond discussion I do think that it, in terms of how you speak for bonds, it, it, we're probably in a good environment looking forward for the bond market because whether it's in March, May, June, or even in the, in the fourth quarter, it doesn't really matter. In 2024, highly anticipated that the Federal Reserve will cut rates, and that's when bonds will flourish as bonds do. Now, think of when we think of bonds, it, it's, they're kind of boring. That's why we don't talk about them much. But they do make up a significant portion of a lot of people's portfolios, but but they are boring. They have a lower, uh, higher floor and a lower ceiling as far as what returns could be. But what we'd seen in December, we talked very little about, but the aggregate bond market was up close to 6% in December, and that is huge for bonds. Now, you could expect to see that with equities and stocks, but not with bonds. That's not that often that you see that. So everyone's portfolio, because both sides of that, the, the stock and the bond portion, had done really well. And now we're giving some of that back. Why are we giving some of that bond back? And it's because of the the timing of the anticipation of when the Federal Reserve will cut rates. So his speech last night probably, did, in the short term, probably didn't help the bond market because we're going to give some of that December hope back from uh, March, May, June, whatever it could be. Uh, for rate cuts, and so, I, but what I what I see though is what I found so interesting is that Friday turned out to be good news was good news, and both sides of that equation reacted the way that it should, textbook it was the way it should, with bonds giving back and equities doing well or stocks doing well, and that's the kind of environment that we're used to seeing where one it's a kind of a yin and yang, one will do well while the other struggles, and vice versa. That's why you have them both. Um, but we, we haven't seen that in quite a while. In 2022, which was a terrible year, it wasn't just a terrible year for stocks. It was a terrible year for bonds as well. And that's where, that, that's where the unusual pain came from. You know, if you think of a 60-40 traditional 60-40 portfolio, that 40% being the bond portion, in the, historically that bond portion would have lifted us up a little bit. We wouldn't have participated so much in the overall fall of the markets but in 2022, we didn't see that. 2023, we saw the opposite, where both had done fairly well. Bonds, not as well as stocks, but they had both done fairly well. And now it's kind of getting in line where, at least for a day, I don't know how long that will last, but at least for a day, where equities were green and the bond side was red. It's really difficult for most people, because we can all look at the S&P and the NASDAQ and the Dow to see how the stock market had performed throughout the day. But for bonds, it's a little bit more difficult. You have to go, like, you will go to a 10-year yield or a two-year, 30-year. We like to look at the 10. But if it's red, that means your existing bond portfolio had went up in value. So you kind of want to see a green and a red if you want to see them both do well. And But when, they're, when it's green, the bond yield is higher, which means current bond prices have dropped in value. So it's, it's a simple yet complex. You need to kind of look at it on the board for it all to make sense. 
uh, equation as far as bonds. But Friday, to me, was very interesting because of how it kind of turned course after lunch. And we said, okay, well, let's be more traditional. We hadn't done this in a while. Let's be more traditional and let the bond struggle a little bit. And the stocks have done well. Stocks have done well because of the good economic data. And we have had overall, we have had good earnings report so far in this quarter. we got more to come this week. But because the bond yield had gone up, current bond prices are now less expensive. So the bond side did poorly. And that was more traditional. And I found that to be kind of relieving because that's what we're used to seeing. That's what we were taught that would happen in most circumstances, and we haven't seen it in quite a while. So I kind of appreciated Friday. It was a good little lesson. And, hey, this is how things are supposed to be, even if it doesn't last. This is how things are supposed to be, and and we saw that on Friday and and in overnight trading last night. Powell had made mention when he was asked the question, will you begin cutting interest rates soon, or are you waiting for inflation to get down to 2.0%? And his response was, We're not waiting for 2.0%. We will cut along the way to that point when we know it's headed in that direction. I'm paraphrasing here. That's not an exact quote, Uh, which was him basically Mm -hmm. saying, I don't have to see the evidence of 2% exactly to know that it's going to be 2%, so we will cut before that. Yes, that's because of the lag from what they do and how long our, our economy sees it. So as inflation continues to fall, and when I go back to what I had said earlier, there's really no reason right now because inflation slowly is making its way to 2%. It is slow, but it's slowly making its way to 2%, and economic data remains strong. Now, the expectation is that at some point we're, we will see some economic softness or more economic softness than what we've seen, and that's when I think that, that would be the trigger for them to cut rates, assuming that inflation is still continuing its way back down to 2%. It takes about three to six months for any movement in rates to make its way through the economy. So you can't wait until you get to 2% because it's going to be too late. Now, they, they know what the the uh, outcome was when they waited too long to increase rates. They, also, they, they certainly don't want to wait too late because that could send us into a recession. So they have the power to, and, and they are sitting in a good position right now, to win that, that game. Did the Federal Reserve do the right thing overall? Did they win the game? They're sitting in a pretty good position because rates remain high and they still have all that arsenal to cut rates to encourage our economy once we start to see employment numbers fall and and wages continue to fall maybe a negative gdp uh once we see all of those things that would be the trigger for the federal reserve so okay we'll start paying his inflation answer was interesting too if you remember bill because i know you saw the segment last night too and in which he said prices won't come down They'll just not increase as much uh, because inflation is lower. Things like gasoline prices, commodity prices, those sorts of things come down because of the fluctuations in the market and the supply and whatever. But if, overall, if you're paying six bucks for a box of cereal now, you're probably going to be paying six bucks for a box of cereal tomorrow yes. too. Right. Yes, and that's John's point because he he continually says, and I listened to fr- on Friday morning to the Friday crew. Uh, John had said, well, it's still 20% more expensive than what it was before, and that's going to remain that way. You know, and that's how inflation works, is it is more expensive because of what we had gone through. However, the overall wage is a little bit uh, is higher as well. I, don't, I, don't, I doubt that it kept up with uh, inflation exactly, but it is a little bit higher, and consumer has cons- shown capacity to still buy that $6 box of cereal but 100%, we're not looking for prices to go down uh, because that, that's not typical, uh, but, but to remain steady and not increase as much as what they were because they'll kind of put the brakes on. Yeah, Phil, uh, my impression last night was quite favorable. I've seen uh, Powell in 30-second film clips, uh, but this is the first time in 15 minutes of just hard questions. Uh, and my, I thought that his demeanor, being very measured, being very calm, uh, was quite reassuring. Uh, and he left the impression that as a group, the 17 other, 17, 18 other economists that are, uh, that's uh, on the uh, Federal Reserve Board are all pretty much in lockstep. They're independent 
uh, voices, but they all view things very similar to what he does. Uh, he made a couple of points I thought was telling. One, ours, our economy, the U.S. economy, is far and away the strongest in the world today, and we recovered much more rapid than the other world yeah. economies. And the second thing is that they have uh, – that early coming out of the pandemic uh they were responding basically out of the hip pocket decision making uh and they were a little slow they were he admitted they were very slow and started increasing rates to address inflation but since then they feel they have the handle on it and they can make adjustments and they, their timing is more exact case in point what we've just been talking about. The inflation is coming down very slowly. He sees no reason of cutting rates now. It's better to hold off probably the next uh, next meeting, but meeting after that in early summer, you'll find another reduction in rates because it's not so much of going increasing inflation again. It's the continual decline of re trying to go toward the 2% point that they're they're working toward. Yes, I've, I've always thought that, that and, I've, and, and mark me down as I've, I've always been, even when he made a mistake, he was quick to say, yeah, we made an error. We waited too long. And I did give them a pass with the COVID movements because they never dealt with that before. You know, you, you, you're walking into something that you have never dealt with. There was no textbook. There was no history on what do we do when the entire world economy shuts down over a pandemic? How do we react to that? And they reacted swiftly and maybe a little bit too much. And I bring up Mitch McConnell a lot, but he had said, you know, they, they, this was forecasted. Hey, the, the, all of this monetary easing and the cutting the rates and the stimulus packages and the PPP, you know, both sides of that party was on, on board with this. And they asked, do you think that this is going to cause problems in the future? And he said, yeah, yes, I do. But you don't worry about the water damage when your house is on fire. And that always stuck with me. And that's how the Federal Reserve reacted. And, of course, they made mistakes. They were going into it blind. But as time has gone on, if they can get through this, get inflation back down uh, to 2% without going into a recession, like they had said last night, we have come through this so much stronger and so much better than every other economy, then you have to give them a passing grade. You have to say the Federal Reserve did a very good job. Yeah, of course, there were mistakes, and we had some economic pain along the way but the uh but if they get get this done without going into a recession or i would still even say it's a win just a narrow win a short-lived recession well you know whether it's in 25 or 26 or whatever it may be the you have to say they did a good job because they were they were shooting from their hip pocket they didn't know they didn't have a playbook they couldn't say well the last time this happened we did this and this was the reaction so let's not do this is that they had none of that so they had to go. They had to go blind, and to this point, as we said in February of 2024, I think that they've done a really good job. We're four years into this now, and we're looking at maybe a light at the end of the tunnel. Whether that's like in March or May or June, and they start cutting rates, and we we announce that we've a we've won the inflation battle. I'm not quite sure. The next battle will then be keeping the economy afloat. But right now, that inflation battle looks like it's on its last leg. And then the next thing is to make sure that the economy doesn't falter too much. Here are some inflation rates around the world, Phil. The U.S. inflation rate, 3.4%. In the U.K., it's 4%. Switzerland, 1.7%. Italy, 0.76%. China, minus 0.3%. That's a problem. Canada, 3.4%. Here are some of the more eye-opening ones. Uh, when you look at uh, numbers that really pop, Turkey, inflation rate, 64.86%. That's nothing compared to Argentina, where the inflation rate is 211%. Wow. I don't even know well, how, the, the, what do you do with that? How do you react to that? I have, no, I have no idea how you react to that, as well as the negative inflation. That's scary. You know, that's the one that pops out, is the negative inflation, in, which is referred to as, deflation and that's scarier than inflation we know how to deal with inflation but dealing with deflation is even more difficult but where the united states sits right now and and i agree with and i didn't know that he had said that but i agree 100 percent our country i mean look at you and you can't gauge the economy by the stock market but you know if you look at the health of the u.s stock market compared to the health of other stock markets 
we've done better. And, and there's, I don't think there's debating it. If you said if everyone was to go back and start all over, I think our blueprint may be the one that they would follow, how we reacted to the, the, the economic issues from COVID, how we reacted to it. I'm not talking about masking and vaccines. I'm just talking about the economic issues uh, to COVID, how our Federal Reserve had behaved and acted toward it may be the blueprint that everyone would follow. <clears throat> you know, one thing I want to correct, we do worry about water damage when you're putting out fires. I'm not sure how that fits into the metaphor, but when it, early into a firefight, you do cover stuff with, they're called salvage covers. The idea is to try to prevent as much damage as possible. That might not fit into McConnell's metaphor, but I just wanted to throw that out there. I have a question for you, though, about... <laughs> Fireman, <laughs> he's on a roll today, John. <laughs> I told I you he was in a bad mood, Bill. If I fire, John, I wouldn't care. I wouldn't cover anything up, man. I would just, I would just go. Put I the fire out. Spray water. We expect yep. when there's a long run on the markets, we expect that there's going to be a correction, and we anticipate it's kind of baked into the cake and we live through it and move on. We went for so long with essentially zero inflation. And that goes before the pandemic. You know, probably go 2008, I want to say. You know, we've sort of been going along with, with no inflation. Is there a built-in correction with historically in economies that say, okay, we've gone this long without any inflation, so bang, we sort of have to have a, a 20% bump? Is, is that... Well... With the ebb and flow of the economy and the markets, yeah, I mean, it's assumed that you have that. Corrections in the markets, now, to separate the conversation with the economy and the markets, the the markets, actually, in a bull market, a correction is very healthy. And we've seen, we've even, we even saw one of those in 2023, and as good as year as it was, the third quarter <clears throat> was terrible. And we went through a period with the banking issues in early 2023, and, it, and some of those indices probably hit a correction there as well. So <clears throat> even with the really good 2023 we had, we had one, maybe two corrections, depending on the indice that you look at. So that is assumed in the equity markets. But when you look at the ebb and flow of the economy, and I'm not an economic professor, but they're also assumed that you're going to have those issues uh, or top periods of low inflation and high inflation. And, and that's why the Federal Reserve has that power to cut rates and increase rates is to control control that to a certain extent and hopefully keep it within boundaries it got a little bit outside we colored a little bit outside the lines when it got up to 9.1 percent but think of that you know rob just read off some of these underdeveloped places with inflation up in the, I, I can't even fathom that 100 200 percent whatever it may be but we we were we were sweating and panicking over and rightfully so on the street by paying for things uh, at just barely over 9%. And if we heard of another, you know, if someone said, hey, Japan's inflation is at over 9%, we wouldn't necessarily feel sorry for them. We would just kind of move on about our day. And that's where we were, and that's what they're that's what they're battling, and that's how bad it got. And it only got that way, and he admi and admittingly says we waited too long. You can go back to why they waited too long. Why did they, if you want to criticize them, why did they wait too long? And they deserve criticism for it. But, again, they were flying blind because the way that you measure inflation is look at the same time period the year before, whether well, the year before in 2021 was COVID. How could you measure those two periods? They're not the same. They're not apples to apples. So that's why they decided to wait. And then all these little events that happened along the way, they kind of slowed them down. They, even when they were began to increase, they didn't do it as much because of all those, those little events. But, yes, back to your question, I think with the economy and the stock market, I don't know that it's baked in is the word I would use. But assumed is the word I would use. When you go through a long period of time, they are assumed. And, of course, there's periods where it goes longer, like we had a bull market that lasted longer than what you ever would have thought. And we had uh, low inflation. I wouldn't say no inflation, but very low inflation. I remember during the Trump era, we were trying to get inflation up to, to I think the target was 2.5%. We were trying to do that. If you guys remember that, that was that was a while, and we were afraid of deflation, the complete opposite of what we, we've been concerned about. But all of those periods are, I wouldn't say baked in, but I would say assumed that that's going to happen. Phil, Super Bowl this weekend, what's your pick? I've been thinking a lot about this, and I'm trying not to let my heart, so I'm going to give you two answers. My heart wants San Francisco to win. I think San Francisco is a better football team. I like the way that they play. Um, my heart would like to see San Francisco win. My head tells me don't bet against Patrick Mahomes. I'm going to go with Kansas City Chiefs win that game 24-20. to 20. I'm going with the Chiefs, even though 
I want San Francisco to win. I like the way you said that. Up. My heart tells me I should have bought Microsoft back in 1988. My head tells me I didn't. <laughs> Therefore, I'm poor. <laughs> Instead of being really, really rich, yeah. I'm going. I'm going to yeah, watch my annual football game. Oh, but you, it's nice you watch the Super Bowl. John. I, I'm going to watch Super Bowl. I'll have yeah. I'll have full analysis. I will next not Monday. partake in the halftime show, though. I have never watched a halftime show. Really? I'm not into the halftime shows. No. Well, I, I watch true. it a couple years ago when Snoop Dogg and those guys were on there. I listened to a little bit of that. But normally, I do not watch the halftime show. Now, the most common question was, what what kind of a doctor is that Dre guy? What does he specialize in? <laughs> yeah. yeah, I normally don't. Produ- I like the commercials, but the uh, halftime show, I normally get up and do whatever chore, whatever I to get something to eat or what what have you. I, I don't usually watch the halftime show. My Early on in my cell phone days, my phone never rang as much as it did with the Janet Jackson halftime show. But I did <laughs> not see that. <laughs> I understand Bud Light's going to try to uh, come back uh, with a with an If they come back with those frogs, yeah. I would be so happy. Those were the best commercials the ever. The frogs were funny. That, yeah. that, that, they were funny. Yes. Uh, I did like them. I will take the Chiefs. I'd never bet against Patrick Mahomes. Uh, and You know, his dad pitched for the Pirates for a brief part of the 2003 like season. And I think he got picked up for I DUI did. over the weekend, and, too. Yeah, he did. And now there's a rumor Andy Reid may hang up the Spurs after this game. So. I don't know why he'd quit. I mean, just keep coaching Patrick, unless Kelsey's quitting. If Kelsey's quitting, <laughs> it, it changes that whole offense a lot. If he's going to retire. Go out on top. If you yeah. win, go out on top, man. He's an old guy. Phil, thanks, man. Thank you, guys. Have a great week. You can catch Financial Phil each weekday morning at uh, 638 with two minutes on the market. And we replay it at 738 as well. That's Financial Phil and John Everson from Ameriprise Financial and the Myriad's Group of Financial Advisors. You can get in touch with them for an appointment today or see them on Winchester at Winchester Avenue in Martinsburg.